today we are going to be talking about habits. Um, we all have habits. Habits are funny things. I have this really bad habit right here. Do we have any other Dr. Pepper fans in the house? Oh! I've tried to quit Dr. Pepper so many times. What is it, August? This year I was like, I'm not going to drink anymore. I'm not going to drink. I think I made it to March, maybe. It was really good. The fast always helps. That January fast always helps. And then, like, I get stressed out, and I'm like, I need a Dr. Pepper. Or I go to the movies, and I get popcorn, and I need a Dr. Pepper. Anybody else like to drink a soda when you eat ice cream? Is, am I the only? I love, like, I need to. I will order a milkshake and a soda. Drink the milkshake. Drink the soda. I don't want them together. I don't want it to be a float. I already know. I already know. I want them to be separate. The burn, it feels so good. Anybody else know what I'm talking about? The burn, like, when, oh, it feels so good. So this morning I said, I need a Dr. Pepper for my message to talk about my habit. And my kids are like, mom, don't do it. Don't do it. Because one of the things I gave up for the fast was sugar. So I'm staring at it and it's calling my name, but I'm not going to do it. So Dr. Pepper, that's one of my bad habits. Um, Biting my fingernails. Any, any other fingernail biters in here? When I get scared or nervous, Brian knows that there's something on my mind because I will be biting my fingernails. Um, and so if I paint them, I won't bite them, but I can't keep them polished often. Um, I finally developed, those are bad habits. I finally developed the good habit of going to the gym weekly. Now, there's only one class that I like. It's only two times a week. That's all it thought. All the gym is getting from me, just twice a week. But I have finally developed that habit to where it's got to be really bad if I'm going to miss. Um, I have another really bad habit. Maybe you can relate to me with this one. It's the habit of trying to break social media. That was the other thing that I did for my fast. It's amazing how social media can have a grip on you and how you can just reach through the phone and you're on Instagram to check a couple of things and then three hours later you still haven't found the end of the internet. You're still scrolling and liking and sometimes going, oh, I don't have that. Anybody relate? Um, it was very refreshing. This morning when I woke up, I was able to kind of pop on Facebook and I had like 93 notifications and it scared me and I was like, and I'm getting off of here. I love social media, but I have to tame that habit because that can become a very bad habit where when I, if I'm not careful, I get sucked into that hole. And I think that all of us are living in the social media world for the first time and that we have to be super careful with that. So habits, talking about habits today, we have good habits, we have bad habits, we have good consequences, we have bad consequences. Um, Pastor Brian has talked for the past three weeks um, on some spiritual habits. Week one was Bible intake, Bible reading, taking it in, not just reading it, okay, I'm done. I did my five-minute devotional this morning, and I am done, but the intake and the chewing on the word. Week two, he talked about prayer, coming to God in prayer, giving him the thanksgiving and praise that is due his name, and praying the word back to him. But God, you said X, Y, Z. And then last week, he talked about, I wasn't in here for any of these. I was in Kids Spring. It was awesome back there, by the way. And last week, he talked about silence and solitude. And when I read that, I kind of laughed because he lives with me. <laughs> Poor guy. Y'all need to pray for him. Not only does he live with me, but he lives with me and three little boys that we homeschool, so we're always home. And so if Brian needs silence and solitude, sometimes he just has to go to Starbucks. I kid you not, it's quieter there than it is in our home. Anybody else can relate to that? Just a few of you. Okay. Um, I know um, Brian needs a shirt that says, can you please stop talking? That's, he needs that shirt for me because I wake up talking. I'm a morning person. And who's my morning people in here? You wake up talking. My garrison's a morning person, and I have realized with him how annoying us morning people can be. Um, 
And then who are my night people? Like you are fired up at night. I am just mood bucket. Like I have turned into a pumpkin. Put me in the bed. Let me wake up in the morning and be joyful and all in your face. Brian leans more toward a night person. So he needs a good cup of coffee before I start talking to him in the morning. Today, we are going to look at a spiritual habit that most might not think of as a spiritual habit. And this is the spiritual habit of connecting in Christ-centered community to connect. Believe it or not, the Word of God talks to us about connecting in community. And we're going to see what the Word says today. I believe that it can be one of the most um, neglected spiritual habits, yet one of the most essential spiritual habits. Because in Christ-centered community, we have prayer, we have Bible intake, we don't really have silence and solitude unless we decide to do that together. I want to talk to you today why Christ-centered community is important. So I want you guys to imagine this with me, if you will. School has just started. Do I have any middle school students in here? Back in the day, back in the day, we called it junior high, like when the dinosaurs roamed during my time. <laughs> um, we called it junior high. I went to da, 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 Saudi Daisy Junior High School. It was only seventh and eighth grade then. Um, back up a little bit. I went to this sweet little elementary school called McConnell Elementary. It was precious. I had a brother two grades ahead of me and a little sister four grades behind me. Um, my mom was like a volunteer mom. Some of the word on the street is they're called helicopter moms. Like they're always there. <laughs> but my mom was volunteer mom extraordinaire. Like she should have gotten an award. She was always at the school. I was very, very comfortable in my elementary school. I remember in third grade sitting in my classroom and I could hear my mother's laugh from the lobby at going down the hall. It was semi-embarrassing and semi-comforting. Like I heard her, oh, my mom's here. And also like, oh my gosh, my mom is here again and I can hear her laugh. Um, so just painting that picture, this school was home to me. And I was known, I was loved. The teachers knew me because my mama was there all the time and I had a big brother who already went through all the classes. And um, I was just well-known. I knew where everything was. I can still smell the smell of that school. At sixth grade graduation, I cried like a baby because I was leaving my precious little school. And I was going into what might as well have been the fifth circle of Dante's Inferno. I was going to junior high. And no one from my precious elementary school was going to junior high with me. What? How could this be? My best friend moved a city away. My other best friend went to a private school. And I somehow was not zoned originally for the elementary school that we got into, but they let us stay there. So I was zoned for a completely different elementary school that I didn't know anybody at that one, that they were all zoned for the junior high school that I had to go to. Terrified. It was the worst summer of my life before middle school. And going there the entire way, my dad took me in the mornings. I was just shaking so bad going to middle school for the first time. And it was as bad as I anticipated it to be. There were lockers, lockers with combinations that you had to go to in between class and you have no friends. Oh, by the way, my big brother had just moved on to high school. So I'm all alone. Um, there were hormones raging. Everyone knew each other. This school was so old. The building was so old. My mother went there for middle school. Um, hormones, lockers, to just make it even worse, I was riding the bus home in the afternoons for the first time in my life. My mama had always taken us home from elementary school, and mama had to work now. And I had to ride the bus home by myself with no friends for the first time in my life. I was alone. I was isolated and I was terrified and I just started going inward. I was a happy, happy, happy little girl in elementary school. 
My world was comfortable. People knew me. I was known. I was loved. And in middle school, I was in this great big sea, and I was just a tiny little fish, and no one had a clue who I was, and no one cared. Nobody wanted to know who I was. And it was awful. I was gossiped about. I was talked about. I was made fun of. And I somehow made a friend who was just as awkward as me that we kind of made it through the first semester of seventh grade together. But there was no joy in it. The second semester of seventh grade, like I'm learning just how to get by, head down, turning very, very quiet because I felt socially awkward and like nobody even cared Um, I met this girl who was on, we had teams. I don't know if they do that anymore. We had, I was on the uh, orange team or something in seventh grade. And um, she kind of made fun of me, but then she befriended me. She was very confident and secure. Um, So we became friends. And in eighth grade, we became really good friends. So middle school led up a little bit in eighth grade. She was like my one and only friend in eighth grade. Things were looking up for high school. Um, And so I'm like, I think I can survive this. Um, Laura was, she was very confident. She was secure. And when we got to high school, Laura made varsity cheerleading. I've told this story before, but I tried out for wrestling cheerleading in high school, like where you sit on a mat and you bang rhythms out on a mat. There's no tumbling. There's no cartwheels. And I didn't make it. (laughs) So... Laura became varsity cheerleader. She achieved popularity, and I achieved anything but that. And I just wanted to be popular. I wanted to have lots of friends. That's where my focus started going. It was just very unhealthy because I wanted what Laura had. Now, Laura and I became really good friends. Like, she is still one of my really good friends to this day. She's one of those girls that I can call up, and we haven't seen or talked to each other in forever. As a matter of fact, when I went back to Chattanooga last November, Laura and I got to see each other on a two-week trip for one hour, and it was wonderful. And she was so gracious just to hang out with me for an hour, because that's all we had. She's a good friend, and I'm so thankful. When I look back now, And I wanted all of these friends, and I wanted this popularity, and I wanted to be the one that was liked, and I wanted to be Laura. I look back now, and I see God's hand in my life and bringing me that very good friend. And I didn't see it then, but I see it now, his provision even then. A lonely, scared little middle schooler that became friends with somebody who achieved something that I didn't, but she still loved me anyway. And now that I'm old... And very much gray. Don't look too close. Um, I've gained maturity and I have understood popularity is for the birds. And if you're in middle school or high school in here and you're wanting and desiring popularity, don't. Getting yourself a close group of friends, one, two, three friends, more than that causes a great amount of trouble if you want to try to keep up. Because you only have so many connector points in your life. I'm thankful that the Lord sent me Laura. And I'm thankful that the Lord helped me through Dante's Inferno level five. And I survived it. And middle schoolers, I'm in your corner. Listen, I have some old yearbooks right here. Unfortunately, I didn't get things scanned in for you this week. But um, man, my eighth grade year, I'm here, in here twice. My picture with my class. And then, y'all, I made the office staff in eighth grade. Yes! Only reason I wanted to be on the office staff is so that I did not have to go to PE all year. Dressing out for PE in seventh grade was Dante's Inferno level six. It was awful. Um, So, if you have ever felt like me, isolated, alone, Maybe you felt like the lone Lego. I'm all by myself. I got it in, Amanda. Um, Or the, the missing puzzle piece. You feel like you have no significance all by yourself. It's just you. This, piece, this puzzle piece, if I don't have the rest of the pieces, it's just there. This Lego... Parents, you've stepped on one in the middle of the night. 
One, that's the only good thing. No, it's not even a good thing. It's a bad consequence of Legos is when you step on one of these bad boys in the middle of the night. It is not what it was intended for. And sometimes we have to repent for what we say after we step on one of those. I'm being, I, I got to be honest. I got to be honest. You want a friend. You want somebody to be in your corner. I heard a sermon recently. Um, I have uh, some really great friends, and we love to share worship songs with each other. This is what you need to do. You need to get through some friends like this. People who will laugh with you, and they'll also send worship songs to you. They'll send sermons to you. They'll say, this was great. You need to listen to it. Um, That is edifying and building up. Um, So this friend sent this sermon. It was awesome. And it was talking about community and connecting. And and so I want to borrow from this sermon. The girl was talking about a boxing ring or MMA fighting. I have three boys at home, so it's boxing or MMA all the time. Okay, without the ring. But if you've seen it, there are two people going at each other. And then the bell rings or whatever they do, and they go back to their corners Who's in their corner with them? It's their coach. It's their encourager. There's like two people there. They are all up in their business, wiping blood off their face, wiping sweat, putting Vaseline on them, and encouraging them along the way. I want two or three people to be like that in my corner instead of having masses in the crowd sitting there going, come on, you can beat up the other person. Come on. No, I want the people in my corner that will wipe away my tears, that will clean up my snot, that will let me bleed all over them when I need to, when I'm going through a hard time. That's what I want. I want to have those people. Remember, there's only two or three in your corner, and that's completely okay. When we live in isolation, we're more likely to give in to temptation. Isolation is a lot easier. You don't have to deal with people. Period. It's just me, myself, and I. You don't have to deal with temptation. Um, You are more likely to become self-absorbed. You don't have to answer anybody but yourself. It's easier that way. Um, You're more likely to spend money in selfish ways because a lot of times when we are isolated, we will spend money on ourselves because it feels good. And right now, I'm lonely. I want to be that way, but I'm going to spend money on me. And we just kind of get into this cycle of being self-absorbed. Now, y'all, I am married to the introvert of all introverts. I love my husband. He is introverted, and that is okay. That is who he is. But he knows, even in his introvertedness, and even though he knows like going home is comfortable, he knows he still has to open himself up to others. He knows that he cannot just live in an introverted state at home. He knows that he has to fight against that. Now, me, sometimes he has to just drag me home. Like, you need to stay at home. You need to, no, no more. You're running yourself in a hole in the ground by doing more and more and more and more and more. So whether you are a middle school, high school student, whether you are male or female, whether you are young, middle-aged, a senior citizen, no matter who you are, maybe you're a seasoned Christian or a newbie, or maybe you're not even a Christian yet. I believe we all have something in common. And that is, is we need, we are designed to flourish in godly connectedness. That's how God made us. Yeah, 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 Ashley. I would (laughs) like seriously come into church and be around as many people as enough. This afternoon, I need to go home and stay at home and be by myself for the rest of the week. Like, I just don't like people, Ashley. Okay, just hear me out for the next few minutes. Let's look at what the Bible says. Look at these Legos. Lego puzzle piece. They are designed to connect. They are designed to to connect. They are designed to support. They are designed to build something, create something. Both of these are designed that way. This is a puzzle piece. Do you guys have any clue what picture this puzzle makes? Anyone? I have one little sweet girl in the back that's raising her hand. I don't know. No? Nobody? Okay, good. That's right. It creates the solar system is what this. I knew. Those of you that, yes, I knew it was the sun. I knew it was the sun. 
And somebody got it. They're like, yes, I'm so good. You're designed to connect and you're designed to build. I have a sweet assistant that I need to come up here. She's going to help me today um, because I'm old and I only go to the gym twice a week. And so I'm going to be out of breath by the time. This is Jaden. Everybody say hi, Jaden. She loves the Lord and she serves him with every fiber of her sweet being. And so she's going to help me today. And she's a lot younger than me, so she can be reaching back and forth to my box. Um, so go ahead and have a seat, and I'll tell you when I need you to grab something for me. You are designed to connect. You are designed to support. You are designed to build. If we take a look at Genesis 2.18, this is at the very beginning. The Lord God said, it is not good for man for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now, guys, God just created this beautiful Garden of Eden. <laughs> it's beautiful. It is sinless. It is perfection. He's made all these animals. He's made all of these beautiful plants. Like, it is a paradise. And he creates Adam, and he says, huh, it's not good. It was perfection. And he says, it is not good for man to be alone. So he created Eve. He created Eve because he knew that connectedness was important. So can I have a blue one, please? Thank you, sweet girl. And just go ahead and get another one ready. So he created Adam. And then he created Eve. And this is the first Lego masterpiece, if you will. And it only expands from there. Let's look at Ecclesiastes 4, 9 through 12. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. Freeze. When in, anybody else, like the great philosopher, Mr. T, says, I pity a fool, when you read that, yes? I mean, even Mr. T got it. I pity a fool. If either one of them falls down, the other will lift them back up. Anyone who falls down, it has no one to help them up. Also, if two lie down together, they keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. We see all throughout Ecclesiastes right there, connectedness. Two are better than one. A cord of three strands cannot be easily broken. And we watch and we see connectedness in the word of God. Um, I got this really cool Bible from a team of people. A team of people here at the Springs. When I um, used to serve as the lead of Kids Spring, and I... Gave that up in obedience to the Lord. Um, the team gave me this beautiful Bible. And what's really, really cool about this Bible is that they went through and they highlighted scriptures in there. And they wrote me sweet notes in the margin for each of the scriptures that they highlighted, individuals. And as I was preparing for this message today, I came across Ecclesiastes, wanting and looking for that verse. And in there, it was highlighted. And there was a note written in the margin. And this is what the note said. So thankful for your friendship and your constant encouragement. You're always there to lift your friends up. And I pray you know I'm here to lift and encourage you up as well. We see connectedness. We see right there displayed what God had designed for us to do. I know with this friend I can call her and ask her to pray. I can call her and say, my children are driving me ever-loving up the wall. Can you get them and save their lives? I can be that real and honest with her. She could stop by my house and my bathroom could be absolutely filthy, and she would not judge me for a second. She has chosen to know me, and she's chosen to be known by me. A cord of three strands cannot be easily broken. And while preparing for this message, I called several friends, or I sent out a message, and I said, when you think about spiritual habits, what do you think of? And we say, prayer, Bible study, serving, um, giving. And one friend with passion, 
Like it was a text, but I could feel the passion behind her text. She said, I strongly feel life groups are necessary. And here's a little backstory about this friend. Her and her mama lost their sweet Dave 16 months ago, tragically and unexpectedly. And so my sweet friends, because her and her mama are both my friends, they felt the community of Christ come around them. The day that they lost Dave, the big C, the big church, it wasn't just people from the Springs Church. A lot of people from the Springs Church fled to their side, but they have friends who are Christians, Christ followers that even go to other churches, fled to their sides and have been there through their darkest hour and through their 16 months of healing and seeking the Lord during their time of loss. And my friend said, she told me that she could not have made it these past 16 months without the love and support of community because the church hustled in when they needed them most because they chose to be known. They chose to reach out and they chose to say, you know, we're here for others. And when tragedy struck them, guess what? Others knew them and were there for them. And so a lot of times we don't think of connectedness and community as a spiritual habit, but it really is. And we're following after what the Lord has commanded us to do. Now, these two ladies actually lead a life group in their home. They open their home up every single week and allow people to come in. And they love on them because they know the value of connecting and serving the Lord together and being in community. My assistant is doing a fantastic job. Connectedness. I know she deserves that. We'll give her that at the end for sure. So the early church in the book of Acts understood the value of connecting as well. Let's take a look at Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47. This scripture is packed with so much goodness, and we're just going to unpack it for a minute. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, and to breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. That is connectedness. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. Every day. What? If we said to you guys, we're going to have church every day, we'd be like, whoa, whoa, there's not enough. There's not enough hours in the days. Let's just learn from the book of Acts. Here we go. They broke bread in the homes and they ate together. Amen for eating food with our Christian brothers and sisters. I'm going to have some sugar today. It's going to be awesome. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved connectedness is attractive to the world. The Lord, like godly connectedness is attractive to the world. These people were meeting together. They were hanging out together. They were loving on each other. And those that didn't know Jesus were watching. And they're like, I want that. I want whatever these people have. I want to break bread and eat with them. Give me a pie Give me some chocolate cake, milkshake from Chick-fil-A. They're not open today. It's so sad. Okay. <laughs> a couple of years ago, I want to talk to you guys about what the early church looked like and how I have seen evidence of the early church right here in the Springs. A few years ago, we have some sweet members of the church who um, simultaneously lost their jobs around the same time. And they were actively searching for new work. And hard times were just falling on them. And they chose to be known. A lot of times when we fall on hard times, we keep it to ourselves, And we're not connected with others. So nobody knows. Nobody can know that we are in a hard time right now. But these folks, two different families, they chose to be known and they chose to ask for prayer. And unbeknownst to them, 
their life groups and friends decided we're going to sell some of our possessions in yard sales. And we're going to give the money that we make from these yard sales to these families so that it takes a little bit of the burden off for them while they are actively looking for jobs. I think we had two or three yard sales, and it was so cool to watch the church come together that way. And then what is even more cool is those families, they ended up getting jobs, and I have watched them pay it forward to others who have fallen on hard times. Like, you don't just stop there and be greedy when you're in community. When you humble yourself and you're known and you say, yeah, I need right now, but you're not always going to be in a place of need. You're going to be in a place of, I have plenty, and then you're able to pay it forward. And it's incredible. And that's what connectedness and community in the Lord does for us. Now, we have a sweet, sweet girl in our congregation. Rosie, raise your hand. Rosie, she didn't know I was going to do this today. Rosie spoke a few weeks ago, so a lot of you have heard her message. But she is following the Lord in obedience. And she is going to go on the mission field, and she's going to be serving with, Des- I want to say, Destiny's Child every single time. I'm so sorry, Rosie. She is going to be serving with Destiny Outreach in Honduras. Oh, Dominican Republic. I'm so sorry, guys. I just messed everything up. So she's going to be going, and she's going to be doing that, and she leaves in February. And so this is what is so cool about the church, big C, and community and connectedness. There is a family in our church that has just really, they are passionate about what Rosie is doing, especially their seven-year-old son. He gets it. He gets it. They've decided we're going to have a yard sale. October 4th and 5th, yep, October 4th and 5th, we're going to have a yard sale to raise money to fund Rosie to go on her two-year missions with Destiny Outreach. They are going to, they're going to, and so they're accepting donations. If you're like, I have stuff that I want to give for this yard sale, they can't take big things because they don't have enough room to store it. But if somebody can take big things and bring it over there, let me know. You can write it on your connection card. Just a practical thing that you can do. And they're also going to be doing some bake sales and stuff after church. (laughs) Homemade goodies. Yes, for Rosie. We didn't ask them to do that. We didn't sit in staff meetings and go, "Mm, what can we do? No, 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 no. This is the big C. This is the church that says, how can I be like an Acts 2 church and help this young lady? It's amazing. We also have another leader of our church who recently, his home caught on fire. And he had to meet an insurance deductible. And as you know, many of us find ourselves in this spot. And we're like, um, I don't have that. And so his life group got together and created a GoFundMe page. And they pasted it out there to help meet our sweet Sal's deductible. And I think it was met and exceeded. And still more donations are coming in for him. That is Christian connectedness. That is being connected in Jesus to take care of a brother who has fallen on difficult times. Let's look at Galatians 6 2. It says, carry each other's burdens and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. Okay, so let's back up in the Bible a little bit and let's go to John 13, 34 through 35. This is what Jesus tells us. A new command I give you. Love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you... What? He said it three times. The man was making his point. Any parents in the room, when you tell your kids something three times, they better be listening. And I think that's what Jesus is getting, up, getting across to us. Love one another. And y'all, I'm just going to tell you, we are all broken human beings in here. I get on some of your nerves so bad. I do. I know it. Everyone does not like me. Everyone certainly doesn't love me. But Jesus says, love one another another. We have to fight against 
what Satan wants to steal, kill, and destroy from us. He wants to say, God, there's that girl again. She's going to get up there, and we're going to be here for three hours. I'm hungry. She just keeps talking. I have no idea how Brian lives with her. She gets on my nerves. She walks back and forth. She always got to have some kind of object lesson up there. I don't even know. We got to fight against that. Brian has taught me this beautiful thing. He heard it from somewhere. Sometimes people are like sandpaper to us. Like they're abrasive. You're thinking of somebody right now. It's probably me. They are abrasive to you. But they are sanding out your rough edges. Jesus tells us, love one another. I am so tired of just the meanness and the anger of the world. I turn on the news and golly, guys, it is not (laughs) the good news. People are attacking each other right and left. I live with three little boys who are learning to love one another all day long. We talk about fruits of the spirit. I need you to be kind to your brother. Was that kind? Was it kindness coming out of your mouth? Love one another. By this, the world will know that you are my disciples. Guys, can we just for a minute just wrap our heads around this? If Satan can cause division among Christians, where Christians are mean to one another, the world's watching. That's not loving one another. And people aren't going to see anything different with you than they see with the rest of the world. But if people are watching Christians say, I am so sorry. I said the dumbest thing to you. I need you to forgive me. I was unkind. I did not show the fruit of the Spirit. The world is watching. And they're going to know that we are his disciples. Let's look at Hebrews 10, 24 through 25. It says, And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Let us consider this. Not giving up meeting together, uh uh-oh, as some are in the habit of doing. Guys, that's a bad habit. He's saying that's a bad habit. Let us spur one another along toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but, everybody say but, encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day approaching. We need to be encouraging each other. We need to be each other's biggest cheerleaders. We need to be spurring each other along. Think about horses. Mr. John's like, yes, horses, spurs. That horse is going to go somewhere when the cowboy is spurring it in the sides. I don't want to be complacent. If my friends see me getting complacent and becoming isolated, and believe me, this extrovert, I can go there. I can get my feelings hurt, and I want to withdraw, and I want to become an island, and I want to be isolated. And I know in the back of my head and in the deepest parts of my heart that that is the enemy trying to get me there because it's a dark, dark place to be isolated. I need people to spur me along. I need to continue to meet together because if I don't, I'm going to fall down this pit and I may never get back. Because if I quit answering the phone, somebody's going to eventually quit calling. When I quit answering the text, somebody's going to eventually quit texting. When I won't answer the door, somebody's going to see it as I'm doing this, and they're eventually going to quit coming. We need to allow ourselves to be known. We need to allow ourselves to connect. Because that's what the Bible tells us that we should do. We are the big C. We are the church. We are meant to do life together. We are stronger together with Jesus as our chief cornerstone. It's all built upon him. 
So fight the urge to do life easier by yourself. Fight the urge to just say no one cares. Here's some practical steps for you, and I may step on some toes, and I'm sorry. I'm apparently really good at that. But this is coming from a heart that loves you, and it's coming from the word. Make church attendance a non-negotiable. Guys, I really love you, and I'm going to say something that might hurt. But if you show up 15 minutes late and you leave as soon as the pastor says amen, you don't get to talk to anybody except for that little five-minute time that we're shaking hands real quick. Come early. We're here. Hang out. It's a really cool lobby out there. Bring your coffee. We don't have coffee yet, but bring your coffee. Bring some treats. Hang out afterwards. I get it. We're all hungry. Just say, maybe I'm going to say 10 minutes later. You know, someday we're going to have that snow cone truck that never showed up on that Sunday. So sorry about that. Oh, they never showed up. But we're going to have them. Stay late and eat snow cones with us. Now I can eat them because that's not really why there was no snow cone truck here that day. It's not because it was a fast and I couldn't have sugar. But we're going to have that snow cone because sister needs a snow cone. September 15th. Yes! Mark your calendars. If it's not here, then we're all going to go to Kona Ice and get one together. Okay. Here's what else I want you to do. Attend the growth track. If you are new to the springs or you've been coming for a while and you're like, I think I want to get plugged in, attend the growth track. It starts back September. I think it's actually September 5th is a Thursday. It starts at 6.30. Write it on your connection card. Let us know if you need childcare. Come and hang out. You will be able to figure out how can I get plugged in, not only to a life group, but also to a ministry serving team. Remember, I got this Bible from a team. They're They're not my life group that I meet with weekly, but they're my team. And people that I got to know and got to love and knew me because we did ministry side by side. It was amazing. Um, so that's a four-part class that starts September 5th at 6.30. Number three, others of you have still not joined a life group. Now is your time. We've made it super easy because we're all meeting here on Wednesday nights, 6.30 to 8. Yes, yes. Okay, so here's what we want you to know. Life groups are the heartbeat of this church. We love life groups. They are super important to us. I got an awesome phone call the other day from a friend that's like, Ashley, are we getting rid of life groups? Because we do not need to get rid of life groups. They are so, so, so important. I felt her passion. And I'm like, we're so, so, so not getting rid of them. We're all just going to meet together. And then we'll break up into little groups like our life groups. We're still going to eat. Hallelujah. Amen. We're still going to eat. Um, and then in January or February, I can't remember. It's one of those two. We will split up into our life groups within our homes again. But this is just a special time to bring us together where it's different than a Sunday morning. Um, some of you have done the Truth Project. I've never done it, but I heard it's incredible. And if you are like, I don't know, I've never really been able to figure out how to get in a life group. Come on Wednesday nights for the Truth Project. I promise you will be able to get into a life group that you will love and support. And I know these life groups, they have things through social media and texting groups and all these things where they are still connecting these next few months, even though they don't have their typical weekday life group where they're meeting kind of thing. I bet you some of them are going to end up going to dinner and stuff together beforehand. (sighs) Yes and amen. We can order dessert now. It's amazing. Lord, we love you. And number four, I want everyone to walk away here today recognizing that connecting in Christ-centered community is a vital part of your spiritual health and growth. Iron sharpening iron being connected in Jesus as with him as our chief cornerstone. And when you leave out of here today, our hospitality team is going to give you a little puzzle piece. Take this puzzle piece and keep it in your car, in the glove box, not the glove box. What is that thing called? Cup holder. Yeah, cup holder. Put it in your wallet where you go and get your debit card out. Keep it somewhere where you can remember, A, to be praying for community, to remember, I need to get plugged in. 
on those days where you feel like, I want to isolate myself, pull out that puzzle piece and say, no, I was made to connect. I was made for something bigger than myself. Jesus made me this way. When, somebody, when you're driving and you're not wanting to show love to the people on the road around you, my kids say I road rage. I do not road rage. They promise you that I do. I do not. If I do, Lord, please forgive me. Help me. Pull out that puzzle piece and remind yourself to love one another instead of doing something else. Let's pray. Lord, I love you so much. I thank you for your word. I thank you for your life-giving word. And I thank you, God, that you are teaching us about habits. To pray, to study your word, to sit in silence and solitude with you, but also to connect with the body of Christ. And Lord, just like Legos, we only have so many connector points. We can't be popular and all the world be our friend and everyone be best friends and super close to us. But you did give us points where we can have two or three that we connect with, that we spur along, that iron sharpens iron. And Lord, that masterpiece keeps growing and growing and growing. And Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters today that do not know you. They found themselves here at the Springs for whatever reason today. And they're hearing about this Jesus and they're hearing about community and they're hearing about connectedness. And they're saying, I don't even know the cornerstone. I don't even know that red Lego she's talking about up there. I don't even know this Jesus. God, I pray that today they give their heart to you. That they don't have to know everything about you before they give themselves fully to you. A relationship with you is a journey. Learning your word. And so I want to give those brothers and sisters an opportunity right now. So if you are here today and you don't know Jesus, I just ask you to repeat after me. And I'm going to ask the whole church to join in with us right now. Lord Jesus, I love you. I am a sinner. I am broken. I am lost. And I am in need of a Savior. Lord, I give my heart to you today. Take it, form it, and make it yours. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.